kind of fun to have a pope named Innocent. But he actually did emphasize, one of his teachings was, he, he, had, he emphasized original innocence. You know how a lot of the popes have, have emphasized original sin. <laughs> and, you know, that tradition has been pretty strong, but he actually emphasized original innocence. So, I think, again, he's talking about this state of I am presence that's prior to error or prior to uh, the belief in separation. Yes? So I've heard um, descriptions of enlightenment as kind of seeing the energy patterns and everything, and you feel at one with those, and this kind of this quality about everything. And do you experience that, or would you see that as another level to attain to, or just wanted to get a comment on that? Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, I've had, um, I've had experiences that I would call revelatory, which, which are, which aren't even like auras or energy patterns. It's actually like, like the veil of separation just kind of uh, breaks open, and then this this light that's not of this world, uh, not not a light of the sun or the moon or fluorescent light or electrical light or flames or anything like that, but it's just this blazing light of, of reality or wisdom that the Course calls the Great Rays, with a capital G and R. I've had three of those revelatory experiences where the world just completely disappeared. And so for me, those were really important indicators of, of this state because it, it showed how flimsy the veil was. It didn't really seem solid. Uh, the closest analogy, the metaphor in this world is like occasionally I've, I've gone to a movie theater where the film back in the projector burns and it just looks so, so all crinkly up on the screen and then it just goes to a blaze of pure light uh, because the, the film literally burns so, so there's, nothing, there's no shadows left. And that's like a, a metaphor within the world. So, um, it's often more a sustained state for me of, of a sense of being very surreal or very dreamlike, movie-like. Um, that's the quality on a, on a daily basis that it seems to be. Also, it's like, I realize that dreams are the same, so whether it seems to be nighttime dreams, you know, while sleeping, or daytime dreams, you start to get this feel like it's all sleep. Like, like you really aren't in a period of waking uh, when it's what seems to be daily life. It's just more dream sequence. But it's watching the dreams, uh, the dream figures seem to come and go, the, sh the sights shift, the scenes shift, but there's a real calmness in, in the watching. And there's a sense of, of not trying to figure anything out. Like there's no sense to try to categorize anything or, or make anything happen or change anything or fix anything. It's just very much a sense of, of watching. And um, so it's, and I, I have had, um, I think for me the synchronicities that people sometimes talk about, uh, it were phases where there were so many synchronicities every day <coughs> that suddenly I, I shifted into this state of acceptance like, like they were happening all the time and it was just like, became natural is the word I want to use, like this, those kind of synchronicities. Like recently I went to a Course in Miracles conference in San Francisco and it was just 417 Course in Miracles students in the same place, there was all these synchronicities, somebody saying, Oh, I was, I was, there was these three elevator shafts in this very tall building, the Holiday Inn, and, and strange things were happening, like we would be walking up to the, to the elevator doors, and the doors would just open, but nobody had pushed the button, uh, and there was nobody in the elevator. It kept happening over and over, we would just walk up and the doors would open, and then there were times when we would be thinking of somebody, and we would look across the elevator, and our doors would open simultaneously, with the doors across the way, there would be the person that we were thinking of, you know, just 
synchronicity, 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 bunches of them. Uh, I missed that at the area from who hosted that. Um, yeah, they host it every two years, and it's a uh, community miracle center down there on Market Street. Yeah. Do you think that uh, mind altering drugs have a place in this process? Yeah, I think they do in the sense that that the drugs are not causative and they do not induce the, the mystical experience, but, but they are part of the script. In other words, people can open up their mind in, to, to a broader horizon in many different ways. And one way that people do on this planet is seemingly through mind-altering drugs. I had a a student back in the 1990s who had some huge, expansive experiences uh, taking mushrooms. And so we would have sessions because he would associate the expansive experiences with the mushrooms as if they had caused the experience and then he would keep going back to the mushrooms over and over, you know, to try to, to experience it again. And I kept working with him and saying, well, it's just your mind was really ready. You just gave yourself permission to experience it, and, and it seems like the scenario involved the mushrooms. You yeah, taking the mushrooms? Yeah, you need to take the pill. Yeah. Which one is it? The red one or the blue one? The red one or the blue one? But I took the pill. That's what he did. Yeah. Yeah. It was a symbol for him. It was a symbol, the and therefore, you know, there should be no stigma attached to that. You know, a lot of times people, you know, right away with drugs, you know, they they have such a stigma as if they've done something wrong, or that's not the correct way, you know, to have a mystical experience. You can have a mystical experience in many different ways. It's just that you want to, you have the spiritual practice so that it can be what we would call a natural high, literally, by your decision, you know, to stay in that place. But I think it's part of it. I have a question about love. I Often, since I've moved here to Kalani, one of the in the past just gets so blissed out on love with just all the people I live with, and all the love in the air, and expressing it all the time, and it's a really wonderful feeling. I know intellectually that it's coming from here, but I wonder if you could speak towards um, like taking more ownership of that or not externalizing it. Yeah. yeah I like the quote from Jesus where he says, when you have if you have achieved the faintest glimmering of love today, you have advanced in distance without measure and in time beyond the count of years. Because that's really what this is all about, is to go into that experience. And I think a lot of times you can have, you know, you give yourself permission and you feel your heart opening and you start to feel this deep, intimate love. It's just so, so powerful. And the ego just tries to jump in and start associating it with certain people or with a certain place. And when that happens, then, then you will try to go back and try to, almost like, recreate it. Or, what did I do? What were the steps that led up to that experience, you know, as, as if there was something in form that caused that experience, when really it was just a, a willingness and a readiness to have that experience. Sometimes they're glimmers and sometimes they can last, you know, they can go on. I know when Helena first met me, she had one of those total unconditional love states that went on for like, is it three months? And it just, you know, it wasn't anything about meeting the body of David or anything, but it was just like, really giving yourself permission to have that, which is always helpful to keep in mind. I had it for two days once after my cousin's wedding, and I just found this, I even yelling out loud in the car, I love the world. <laughs> and, but I want to be able to have, have that more often. Yeah. That's good. Uh, on a practical level, um, I had found myself in a pretty blissful state here in Kalani a year ago, let's say. And then I went into physical dis disease, and it seems like that's my pattern. I'll find myself in a good state, and then I'll find disease. How would you deal with that? What would you do? Well, you you can just see that that the disease is like a, it's like an ego reaction to the bliss. So it's like 
you know, the ego is is very threatened by the that blissful experience. And it's almost like a sometimes it feels like a backlash or almost like a meltdown uh, for the ego when that happens. And and yet from a from a practical perspective, it's just that, that you're giving yourself permission for these thoughts to come up that are blocking the, the bliss from being in consistent awareness. You're just giving yourself an opportunity to let them come up. And the, the key is to be able to, to see them with the, with the Spirit, with the Holy Spirit, and see them for what they are. Kind of get, get on the other side of them, because from within those thoughts, it seems pretty dark, you know, it's like, it's, it's almost like a blocking off of that experience, but more and more I would just have those periods where I would just see those as golden opportunities, you know, like, okay, there's something really I'm supposed to take a look at, and I'm giving myself permission to, to take a look at this, to really expose it. There's an interesting line where Jesus actually defines resistance in positive terms. I was thinking, how do you do that? <laughs> to define resistance in positive terms. But he says, resistance is the ego's interpretation of progress and growth. I like that. The progress and growth is always occurring, even when it seems to be interpreted as disease. And the ego is, is resisting the pull into the love, and so it's a, interpreting uh, this as a struggle, and it's interpreting it as a resistance, but it's actually, there's goodness underneath it. Always things are working together for the good. So it's resistance and then moving along. Yeah, yeah, it's a positive. I was like, I think this in the psychotherapy panel when I first read it, I'm like, oh my god. No. A positive definition of resistance, that's, that's what I like to hear. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah. Yes. The word transcendence, just a basic question, what are you transcending? Uh, it's just the ego, it's just transcending a belief of something other than love. You know, is what, what is transcendence. And so, you know, in the state of oneness, then there is no idea of transcendence, because it's like a, a sense of rising above something, or overcoming, and, and it, when everything starts to stabilize, and you start to feel that wholeness, then, then what seemed to be transcendence is just like, oh, natural. Like this is, this free flow is the way that, that things really are. Transcendence is transcending the ego, transcending the barriers between, uh, of our mind and love. Yes, and yes, actually uh, that word um, trans comes in too with, uh, with a branch of psychology, transpersonal psychology. There's a branch of psychology that's literally dedicated to transcending the personality. Uh, transcending the personal perspective and coming into that whole perspective. And that's, that's pretty much how I, I got into the course. I mean, I started off being interested in humanistic psychology. Um, uh, when I, I read a lot of the books of a lot of the humanistic psychologists, uh, it seems like a lot of them were, spent a lot of time at Esalen uh, in California, and then when I come to Kalani, Kalani reminds me a lot of Esla, you know, or uh, what's it uh, in um, upstate New York? What's Omega. the Omega Institute? Yeah, there seems to be a lot of parallels there. But I had some. I was invited to Esla, and I went there and and was sharing and everything. And I just when I came here to Kalani, I was like, huh. It's like memories of Esalen were coming up, but that, that's like reminds me of that branch of psychology that just started to to transcend those old ways of looking at things. Like uh, just like the A Course in Miracles transcends those old distorted ways of looking at Christianity, which were just egoic, 
Um, you might say that transpersonal psychology goes way past, you know, uh, Freudian psychology, uh, psychoanalysis, way past um, stimulus response, kind of um, behavioral reinforcement, a lot of those deterministic kind of um, psychologies, you know, transpersonal just goes so far. So I find a lot of parallels in what I would read in transpersonal psychology in the course uh, and in a lot of Eastern philosophies, you know, it's just you start to pick up many different books and go, ah, that resonates, that resonates, and you know, you see that there's many different forms, but there's just this resonance in your heart when you read something and it rings true. It's like, uh, I always felt like a little tickle in my heart, like, okay, pay attention, this is truth coming through there, and you know, it's very, very helpful that way.